Um, hi, my name is Catherine C. I'm the Head of Respiratory Medicine at Northern Health and I'm the Chair of the Northern Health Winter Strategy Committee. Um, so after winter 2017 at Northern Health, I think no one wanted to have another winter like that again. I'm sure that most Victorian health services felt the same way. Um, and so we decided that we needed um, to really plan and to plan early how we were going to manage that demand in 2018. So we started talking about what our winter strategy would look like in December of last year. And um, we established our winter strategy committee in January. So our Winter Strategy Committee has um, a diverse multidisciplinary membership. So um, we've got clinical people, operational people, um, there's finance, communications, um, infection prevention, pathology. We've tried to be incredibly inclusive um, to make sure that everyone has a say. And also um, it includes people of all different levels of um, seniority and management. So we've got general managers all the way through to people who are solely clinical working on the floor. Um, so we established the committee um, using high reliability organisation principles. So Northern Health is on a journey to becoming a high reliability organisation. So for us in health, so typical um, high reliability organisation fields tend to be um, aviation, nuclear power. Um, for us in health, um, we see it as every single person in the hospital being an expert in their particular job, which means that every single person knows how their role can improve patient safety and means that every single person in the hospital is responsible for improving patient safety. We called upon subject matter, sorry, subject matter experts as required um, and we reported monthly to our operational access committee. Um, given there were people of so many different levels on the committee, it's, and it's something that's very important to me, um, we had clear expectations of what professional behaviour looked like and how respectful communication would be the only form of communication that would be tolerated. Um, in an environment with lots of different people who have lots of different, quite strong opinions. We didn't have any issues, which was good. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, our strategy was data-driven and evidence-based. So one of the first things that we did was to conduct an extensive literature search to look for strategies that other health services, both in Australia and internationally, had published to um, improve flow, reduce length of stay, improve quality of care. Um, and we used a systems thinking approach. Um, so after our kickoff workshop in January, we came up with a series of initiatives that were grouped under four main priority areas. So optimising patient flow throughout the organisation, managing the influx of patients with respiratory illness, um, ensuring our optimal workforce capacity, and streamlining the discharge process. So as you can see, we had a series of initiatives under um, all of those different headings. Um, and that's what I'm going to run through right now. Um, so we monitored um, all of the initiatives with our winter scorecard. So um, our winter scorecard was a six page PDF, which came out every week. And unlike um, an access or um, activity scorecard, it was really designed for the people who work on the floor. So it's got um, vaccination rates, um, sick leave, overtime, um, our hospital in the home utilisation, how many respiratory swabs were being sent, how many were coming back positive so that we could track um, when the flu season really started to hit. Um, and that was available each week on our uh, Winter Strategy webpage and was discussed every Monday at our health service wide um, meeting called The Wall. Uh, we also had a series of videos, um, which are kind of cheesy, uh, to help um, communicate the different components of the strategy to our broader, broader healthcare um, community. 
Uh, and we ran an incentive program um, for suggestions from the staff with a week's free coffee and an email address that they could send suggestions to, um, both just highlighting issues that they thought needed to be addressed or also coming up with potential solutions. Um, so one of the first things that we identified was that um, we didn't have an organisation-wide overarching um, overcapacity policy. And so um, given it's well recognised that ED overcrowding and access block is associated with suboptimal outcomes, um, we developed, that was one of the first things we developed, an organisational-wide response. So there are three levels of response to our code surge, well, sorry, to our overcapacity policy, with the third level being the code surge. And when a code surge happens, that indicates that there are more than 40 patients in our emergency department requiring inpatient beds. And so what that activates is a series of communications. So our inpatient medical units are notified, oh, sorry, our inpatient, not just medical, but um, medical and surgical units are notified through um, the paging system that we're in a surge. Um, it's communicated through SMS and email to um, our senior leaders and all of the heads of unit. And then everyone has a little laminated card attached to their ID badge, which has very, very clear um, roles and responsibilities for what is to happen when a code surge is called. There are also multidisciplinary and multi-campus huddles um, every two hours until the code surge is able to be stood down. Um, so over our winter period, so between May and September, we had 10 code surges. Um, most of them were early in the week, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the majority of them were able to be stood down within three hours. Um, depending on the types of patients that are in the emergency department, different responses in terms of opening of flex beds occur. So if there are lots of surgical patients, we might open our day procedure unit and keep that open overnight. Um, do we need additional short stay beds that have telemetry available? Um, it's very much tailored to the patients who are in the emergency department at that particular occasion. Um, so now that we've got about six months worth of data from the code surge, we're undertaking a detailed analysis to try to understand um, some of the preceding factors. Um, it would be great to be able to develop plans to prevent overcrowding becoming so severe that we need to be calling code surges. Um, so some causal factors have, have been identified and there's usually a combination of these that lead to a code surge rather than any one particular factor. Um, but often we see a surge in arrivals, often for more than um, two consecutive hours. Um, there's often a slowdown in emergency processing, so we see a delay in time to treatment. We see blocking of key parts of flow, so if our short stay unit or our observation unit is blocked with patients who are then needing admission, that has a very significant impact um, on our um, on our capacity, and then higher than usual inpatient occupancy. Um, so at the moment we're in the process of trying to identify some triggers um, so that we can um, act earlier to avoid having to call the code surge. So um, as I said, we did an extensive literature review and so one of the strategies that we came up had been published by another Melbourne hospital and that's the Targeted Acute Rehabilitation Program also known as TARP. Um, and so our, our targeted acute rehabilitation program is designed to combat the fact that the subacute waiting list is increased over the winter period. And so the TARP program um, identifies a subset of patients who with increased allied health intervention are able to be discharged either directly home or who have a um, reduced length of stay in subacute. So the team composition, as you can see there, is quite comprehensive in terms of allied health. And so from the middle of May, when they um, actually got up and running to September, um, 214 patients were tarped, as we would say. 
um, which was 1,723 encounters, which was an average of 8.5 encounters per patient or 2.6 allied health encounters per patient per day. We did see a significant bed day saving, so 168 rehabilitation day bed days saved and 156 gem bed, save, bed days saved. And 44% of the patients were able to be discharged directly home. Uh, we did some staff and patient satisfaction surveys and 100% of the patients were satisfied with the program, which was great to see. And there was no indication that the increased intervention that they had received had caused any significant stress and the families all reported that they had felt um, engaged in the decision making process. Um, and the staff feedback that we received um, was overwhelmingly positive and they were very keen to have the program continue um, even if it is just next year. Um, so we also increased our hospital in the home service so we identified that there was a um, significant waiting list for our hospital in the home service um, and potentially with increased um, access to HIF beds uh, we could um, free up some inpatient capacity. So we increased from 45 to 60 beds um, and obviously there was an increased cost of 15 HIF beds but um, that was offset by the ability to have 15 additional inpatient beds. Um, on the right, you can see the graph of our occupancy, and so um, those beds were able to be filled. So occupancy, that's just the last two weeks of September, um, sitting between 57 and 63 patients consistently. Um, so this um, increased our capacity improving flow, and we also found greater patient satisfaction um, at patients being treated comfortably in their own homes. Um, in terms of lessons learned and how we would um, continue um, this service in the future, um, while the HIF team do go to the ward to try and pull patients across, we're working with the medical and surgical units um, to encourage early referral um, so that we can get patients out in the most timely manner possible. And um, going forward, we're also looking at exploring new patient groups. So d more direct referrals from emergency um, linking with our community team, so our heart failure team, our residential in-reach team, um, direct referral from outpatients and also looking at direct referrals from GPs. And I would just like to say that the November data is actually incomplete, which is why it looks as though our occupancy for November has dropped. It actually hasn't. It's um, still consistently 59. <coughs> Uh, so in January of this year, our residential in-reach service um, increased to a seven-day-a-week um, nursing service. However, the feedback from the residential in-reach nurses was that their ability to prevent emergency presentations on the weekend was limited by the lack of medical support. And so what we did um, was to increase the aged care registrar hours so the aged care registrar was already performing a ward round in our acute um, aged care facility and so they just did an extra three and a half hours in the afternoon. They only do one in eight weekends so it wasn't particularly arduous for them. Um, and so each weekend day the registrar saw on average two to three patients and were able to admit several patients directly to HIF and then several patients directly to the acute aged care unit. Um, so in terms of costs, there was seven additional um, registrar hours per week. Um, however, this was offset by direct admissions to HIF. There was significantly greater um, nursing satisfaction for the residential in-reach nurses, and it allowed us to be far more responsive to the needs of our community. Um, one lesson that we did learn would be uh, to ensure adequate data collection um, because it's been slightly challenging to accurately evaluate this particular intervention through just a lack of, of clear records of actual um, contacts with the registrar. Um, so hot clinics. Uh, so we identified that there was a lack of ability um, to have short notice specialist appointments. And so between June and September, we set up rapid access clinics um, for general medical patients with a view to either um, avoiding admissions or reducing length of stay with early review. 
Um, so 46% of cases uh, were referred to either avoid admission or reduce length of stay. And urgent review being required was the next most common um, reason for clinic referral, particularly due to how easy it was to get patients into the hot clinic compared to so many of our other um, medical clinics. Um, this was unfortunately one of our least successful initiatives, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, so looking to the future, um, we'd be really keen to promote the service more aggressively um, and to ensure that the appropriate patients are being referred to maximise the clinic's efficiency. Um, we didn't have very many routine appointments, but always ensuring that urgent appointments are um, the cases being booked. I think potentially the main issue um, is our inability to have a streamlined booking system, which we will have addressed before next winter. Um, our outpatient service is undergoing some significant um, improvements. Um, and we're looking at um, developing some pathways uh, for the DIGs in which the hot clinics were the most successful um, and I'd better identifying particular cohorts for this service. So fortunately, we didn't have a terrible flu season this year, um, but in the 2017 influenza season, our respiratory viral PCR turnaround times were between three and five days. So when you've only got a limited number of isolation rooms, that is particularly challenging and it caused significant block for our organisation. Um, so we sought to increase the frequency of transport to the testing laboratory. We investigated point of care testing for our emergency department and tried to increase um, the testing laboratory's hours. So our pathology is provided by an external private provider, um, but is being brought in-house from January um, of next year. Um, so the agreed upon actions with our external provider were for pathology hours of operation to increase, um, increased courier runs, and point of care testing was thoroughly investigated, however, was determined to lack sufficient sensitivity and specificity um, to be able to be successfully implemented in our health service. Um, so we did have an improvement in our PCR turnaround times to about 24 hours, but we very much look forward to having our own pathology in-house where they've assured us it will be shorter. Uh, we also identified that a lot of um, potentially unnecessary respiratory viral PCRs were being ordered for patients who had clearly alternative diagnoses. Um, and so we sought to support the junior medical staff by developing an influenza-like illness protocol and flow chart, which provides them with the information of who does need a respiratory viral swab and who doesn't need a respiratory viral swab. Um, there's also a complete protocol now um, which is available uh, with the flowchart on our prompt um, guideline. And between May and September, the prompt um, guideline had been downloaded 120 times. So it does appear as though some people, at least in the organisation, know that it exists. We did do quite um, intensive junior doctor education surrounding the flowchart, and we have seen a significant reduction in the number of um, uh, PCRs or both PCRs being ordered, but also an increase in the rate of positivity, suggesting that they're targeting their ordering um, more appropriately. Um, so we only had 45 positive um, uh, respiratory viral PCRs um, between April and September of this year, compared to 263 in 2017. Also in the 2017 influenza season, uh, we ran out of um, the duckbill fluid resistant level two masks um, and they were on back order with the supplier. <coughs> so we were required to use the N95 masks, um, which are more traditionally used for patients in airborne precautions like tuberculosis. Um, the N95s are significantly more expensive um, than the duckbill fluid resistant level two masks. And so um, Northern Health Procurement ensured that there was adequate supply and that staff were trained on appropriate mask selection. So we got the supplier to double their winter forecast 
Um, we provided education and conducted spot audits on appropriate selection of PPE. Um, and we actually were able to significantly reduce the amount of money spent on masks. Um, so in July alone, um, by normalising the distribution of N95 masks over the year, we were able to save $3,000 per month because if they're designed for tuberculosis, tuberculosis shouldn't really be very seasonal like influenza. Um, still with flu, uh, Northern Health um, had a, an opportunistic strategy of vaccination for our local community. Um, so our um, influenza strategy ran between May and September. Uh, we had a booth in the front foyer of the hospital where um, patients, visitors, um, everyone was able to come and receive free influenza vaccination. Um, we also trained an additional 82 nurse immunisers, um, which meant that on every ward in the hospital, in every area, there were people who could give uh, influenza vaccines. So we vaccinated a lot of people. <laughs> um, 11,726 um, members of the community. So the majority of them were outpatients, 10,300, um, with a th about 1,000 inpatients being vaccinated. Um, it would appear that if you're sick in hospital, you don't really want to have the flu shot on top of feeling sick, understandably. Um, and all of these um, nurse immunisers in various parts of the hospital meant that we were able to um, uh, reach a staff vaccination rate of 87.9%, which was fantastic. Um, so with the increased demand for beds over the winter period, there's, and code surges tend to be called in the morning for us, there's a demand for early discharges to try and improve flow throughout the day. And what we were finding was that our junior doctors were being very good and diligent and um, writing their discharge scripts the night before the patient was due to be discharged. However, it was usually between 5 and 8 p.m. Um, when there is no ward pharmacy staff available to actually process, um, reconcile, dispense, counsel um, the patient regarding their medications. And so what we did was to extend our pharmacy service on our largest medical ward um, with the addition of an evening pharmacist between 4 and 8 p.m. And so that aligned with our junior medical staffing hours. Um, as a junior doctor from every single team on that ward is on site until 8. Um, and so the additional pharmacy EFT was 0.5 EFT for a grade 2 pharmacist. And that is actually Amrita, our pharmacist. Um, and so with these additional hours, we were able to see a 50% increase in our number of discharges before 12 p.m., which was really exciting. We also saw a significant increase in the completion of our medication management plans. So an increase from 30% completion to 80% completion. And by um, a higher number of MMPs being completed, it significantly reduced the amount of time pharmacists spent checking the discharge prescriptions um, and improve medication safety and patient outcomes by reducing the number of prescribing errors. So there's been overwhelmingly positive feedback. Um, yes, mainly from junior doctors from my team, but I swear other junior doctors were also very happy. Um, and they, they commented that there were less drug errors, um, more timely discharge scripts and medications provi provided. Um, it helped them get patients home earlier the next day. Um, and the nursing staff reported that it had been fantastic in aiding both criteria-led discharge and also our ED toward our 8.30 discharges. Um, in terms of next steps, um, we have added a ward um, pharmacy technician to, the medical, to this particular medical ward as well. And we're considering rolling out increased pharmacy hours across some of our high turnover wards in the evening as well. Okay, so Transit Lounge. Um, we identified that our Transit Lounge opening hours were not actually meeting the demand for discharged patients during times of high demand. So our Transit Lounge was closing at 4 p.m., was often full until midday. However, we were unable to get a second wave of patients through 
given their families or carers had to be there before four o'clock to collect them. People often are at work unable to do that. And so patients were taking up an inpatient bed for the whole afternoon. So what we did was we extended the transit lounge hours um, till seven o'clock on the, a weekday and we added transit lounge hours on a Sunday. So we previously didn't have the transit lounge open at all on a Sunday. Um, this required 1.68 additional nursing EFT, but we did see a 30% increased utilisation in the transit lounge. So you can see the clear signal from when the hours increase. And what we did find was that we were getting that second wave of patients through in the afternoon after the morning patients had been discharged. So what was the impact? Um, as a clinician, um, I like data, I like evidence, I like analysis. It's what I do for all of my patients. Why wouldn't I do it for healthcare resource utilization? And so we were really pleased to see a 6.6% improvement in our niche, despite 2,535 additional ED presentations um, compared to the same time the year prior. And we were able to do that while maintaining our elective surgical numbers as well. So what's in store for next winter? Um, so we really want to work on consolidating the dialogue with primary care. Um, I think that that's something um, that we can really, really strengthen and running more education workshops linking with primary care is something that we're focusing on at the moment. Um, we're going to um, try and streamline and promote our hot clinics. Um, we're looking at condition specific um, emergency diversion. So rather than complete category four, category, category five diversion for which there's not great evidence, um, more condition specific diversion for where there is better evidence. And we're trying to explore innovative models of care. So what current services do we provide for inpatients that we could provide in an ambulatory setting with greater resourcing or um, different ways of doing things? So I'd like to thank all of the members of our Winter Strategy Committee. Obviously, it's awful being part of my committee because I make you come to work, dress up in ridiculous winter clothes, <laughs> complete with skis and have awful photos taken. Um, but they're very tolerant of me, which is very kind. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Northern Health Executive. Um, it's amazing to work in a health service with an exec who are genuinely committed to not only engaging with clinical staff, but with empowering them to change our hospital systems to improve patient care. Thank you. I've got a question. Good. There's a couple of questions online. Anita Wilson from Eastern Health yes. is asking about the TARP team. Yes. Where did they focus their service delivery? Was it in the ED, acute inpatients, or added to subacute? Thank you. Right. Um, so the TARP program uh, was for our acute inpatients. And so um, what happened was the physiotherapists um, performed a Mylowa score. Um, to determine which a subset of patients that would be able to be discharged directly home or likely to be able to be discharged directly home with increased intervention. Um, and so that's how the, that patient population was selected. And another question from Nat Bemrose from Safe Care Victoria. What's the process for a patient being admitted to ward from ED? I do wards accept patients or are they handed over from ED to ward? So, sorry, so our patients... Um, she said, are they, are they accepted or are they so handed push or pull. over? No, so maybe is it a push or pull arrangement with the admission? Do you send them out of the ED, I think she's saying? Yeah. Or do the wards say... <coughs> Come you know, down. Oh, so, so, so oh, the wards pull them? Yep. Yep, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry, thank Any you. Other?